Good afternoon. Um, it's time for us to get started. So first announcement is the exam grades are not ready yet. Still working on those. Uh, typically it take me like a week. So hopefully by Wednesday you should have the, the scores and, and the feedback on, on the exam. So um, other than that, we're gonna continue our discussion. Any Any questions? Yeah, so I plan to have the, the exam and also uh, I'll bring the, the answers on, on Wednesday if I finish the, the grading. Uh, so we can discuss uh, the questions and the answers and then give you an opportunity to, to get feedback. Um, so in terms of the material, uh, what's next? Uh, we, we already, the first part of the semester, we went through some of the uh, ideas in terms of uh, what type of, of planning is, is done when you're designing the, the layout of a facility. We also discussed uh, different type of algorithms that could be used for, for those purposes, especially for the location of departments and, and so on. And now we're gonna to transition to uh, all the areas of the facilities planning and design. One of those areas are, we're gonna be looking at some of the, the areas uh, that interact with, with our designs. And, and one of those subjects that are very important is the management of supply chain. So we're gonna spend some time today talking about what supply chain management is and how that interacts with the design of your facility. Um, so this connects with the first objective for this class, which is to develop an understanding of the principles of facilities location, layout, material handling systems, and to practice uh, the designing of facilities. So these are the, the topics that we are going to, to discuss. Um, for those of you who are industrial engineers uh, or you are in the industrial engineering program, you might have some experience or you might have taken a class already on supply chain management. Those in manufacturing, you might not have as uh, much experience. So uh, this is a, a good lecture for you to get a, an understanding of how these interact with the design of the facility. But in addition to that, you understand uh, supply, ma supply chain management in general. So these are the subjects, a supply chain strategy framework, uh, components of uh, supply chain management, and some of the major obstacles. 
and common problems that you will face when you're trying to design the logistic aspect of your, of your company. And obviously in that aspect, you will get interaction with warehouses, the manufacturing plants and so on. So here, this is a little history here. Um, the traditional view of supply chain in the economy back in the 90s, it was a fight between transportation and inventory managers. So they were trying to figure out, okay, we need to reduce costs. Uh, so we, should we reduce costs in terms of transportation or should we reduce costs in terms of inventory? So it was a constant fight. Uh, as you can see here, there's a difference in terms of cost in six years, in terms of freight, freight transportation, um, inventory expense. So you used to have a manager for transportation and also a separate management for the inventory. Uh, all, both of them managed separately. Okay, so no interaction. And you see for this six year period, uh, a, a huge increase in the, the amount of money that was spent. In addition to that, you have the administrative expense and the logistic related activity when compared to the gross domestic or gross natural product was about 11%, 10%. So it's a lot of money. Um, so again, traditionally firms will have an inventory manager and transportation manager. This is what, what I'm trying to illustrate in this picture. And they were fighting for, for the same resources or not necessarily for reducing costs of blaming each other, no interaction in terms of planning. And this view is very narrow and caused very uh, significant problems in the proper functioning of the supply chain. When we think about the cost breakdown of a manufacturing good, you can see in this uh, slide that 10%, uh, only 10% accounts for the profit. And then you have a supply chain cost that is about 20%, marketing cost 25%, and the manufacturing cost about 40, 45%. The key message here is that the logistics costs are a significant fraction of the total product, right? It's 20%. Um, but those efforts that are spent in the supply chain activities are not visible, are invisible for the customers. Uh, so we as customers, we don't get the, the overall picture of what's going on. Um, so the problem here is that this is a purely cost-based view of the supply chain that so drives a firm to simply reduce the logistics cost. So they say, okay, we're spending this much in, in logistics, transportation, so if we want to make this product more uh, less expensive, let's try to reduce that 20% cost associated with the supply chain. Uh, however, you saw what happened with COVID uh, when you try to minimize supply chain costs, minimize your inventory. Then when there's a sudden change in, in the demand, you might not get access to, to the products that you need on the time you need them. So supply chain, um, planning for the supply chain uh, has to be done in a way that we account for all possible uh, elements and, and possibilities that can happen in terms of sudden change of events. Um, so in terms of the magnitude of supply chain management, uh, if you remember, these are again, examples. Uh, Compaq used to uh, sell computers, they are no longer uh, I think it they were purchased by uh, Hurley Parker at some point uh, when they were one of the leaders in, the, in, in this area. And they lost between 0.5 billion to 1 billion in sales in 1995 because laptops were not available when they were needed. Uh, Protect and Gamble estimated saved retail customers about 65 million in 18 months by collaborating, resulting in a better match of supply and demand. So remember, at the beginning of the lecture, we were, there were two areas, inventory, um, logistic managers trying to fight. Now, what Procter & Gamble showed was that if you have a collaboration, if you are able to understand the demand and the supply, and you can plan based on those terms, you can find some uh, commitment, right? In which you can save uh, money for the customers. 
Uh, when the one gig processor was introduced by M M AMD, the price of the 800 meg processor dropped by 3%. So that's another thing that we need to be aware of. Like sudden changes in availability of products, where product can also have an impact on, on the demand for our products and obviously on the plan for our supply chain. Uh, so the importance of supply chain man management understood by some, uh, we have M AMR research. The biggest issue enterprises face today is intelligent visibility of their supply chain, both upstream and down. So if you understand what you have on the pipeline in terms of your products, and also you understand the demand and the supply aspects of your supply chain, if you don't have a, a good visibility of what's going on, then you you face um, a lot of challenges. Uh, in terms of forester research, company needs to sense and proactively respond to unanticipated variation in supply and demand by adopting emerging, emerging technologies such as intelligent agents. To boost their operation agility, firms need to transform their static supply chains into adaptive supply chains. Supply chains that are able to adapt, supply chains that are able to reconfigure in terms of finding suppliers, uh, maybe having a backup plan if you don't get access to suppliers in other countries, or maybe have the ability to produce uh, inside, meaning that you keep your, your supplier, but at the same time, you develop the cap capability at home to be able to respond to uh, unexpected changes in the demand. Garner Group, by 2024, 90% of enterprises that fail to apply supply chain management technology and processes to increase the agility will lose their status as preferred suppliers. Um, but the idea with this statement is meaning that agility is important. You have to be aware of, of, of the possible circumstances and then plan for those uh, so you can adapt. Here's a list of the top 25 supply chain. Uh, based on companies. See at the top, we have Colgate and Palmolive. This was for 2019. Um, and then you have on this area on the right, the, the top ones. Uh, so these are like out of, of, of the 25, these are the highest rank. So Apple, Procter & Gamble, Amazon, McDonald's, and Unilever. Um, so you can see that, that there's a lot of recognizable names uh, so it's not um, uncommon to see those names right there. You know, we, we were consumers of most of those brands. Um, but they are not there just because they are recognizable brands. It's because they have a very good strategy and they have a very good supply chain and logistics. So when you go to the stores, you'll find those products easily. And that's because they are a very good um, supply chain management uh, policies. Uh, so generated value for supply chain, we want to minimize supply chain costs while keeping a reasonable service level uh, in terms of customer satisfaction, quality, and on-time delivery, right? So you wanna make sure that, I mean, you, you want to be efficient, but at the same time, you wanna keep your customer happy. So if you cross that line, then you'll be in trouble. So our goal as managers to minimize the supply chain costs, but making sure that we have a good reasonable service level for our customers, uh, our um, buyers, we can deliver on time and we deliver a good product. This is how supply chain management contributes to the bottom line. Uh, so this is not, and this is, what I want you to keep in your mind, if you want to get something from, from this lecture, is that this is not a cost reduction paradigm. Okay, so you know it's gonna there's gonna be a good amount of money that is gonna go into planning for the supply chain, but at the same time, those are operations that are really important, right? You you want to deliver your product on time, you want to deliver uh, the right amount, and you want to on time. So. This is not strictly a cost reduction paradigm. This is, has to be a company with the, the service of level that you have to provide to your customers. So when you think about the supply chain, 
this is an illustration of what is involved. So you have the supplier. Supplier will be obviously providing the, the raw materials to the manufacturer. So you wanna get this, this product or these materials into your facility, the manufacturer will uh, develop the product. And once the product is complete, there's the distribution aspect. The distribution will take the, the product to the retailer or wherever the, the, the customer will access the, the product and then the customer will buy. So this is again, upstream to downstream. Um, the aim is to match the supply with the demand. You don't wanna have more product than the demand that you're gonna have or you expect to have because that will create high inventories and um, it's more expensive, obviously. So you wanna to try to match the supply and demand. And at the same time, you don't wanna have more demand for your product that you what you have in inventory. So we wanna match that uh, profitability for products and services. So that's what I'm trying to illustrate here on the right, the balance between the supply and the demand. Uh, so the, the goal is to achieve the right product at the right price in the right store, the right quantity to the right customer at the right time. That combination is what's going to increase your, your profit. So a lot of things, right? Uh, so finding that balance, making sure that you have access to the product or you provide access to the product at the right time, right store, um, at the right price to the right customer. So here's an example. This is the detergent supply chain. The idea here is that to see that supply chains involve everybody from the customer all the way to the last supplier. So you, you have the customer on one corner and then the, the initial supplier here at the bottom. Um, key flows in the supply chain are information, product, and cash. Uh, so you have all those things going on, moving around, information, how much you have available, money, you have to pay your suppliers, and obviously the product. Um, it is through these flows that the supply chains fill a customer order. The management of, the, of these flows is key to the success or failure of the, fam, of the firm. So for example, you can compare uh, Dell that you are familiar with, with Compaq that doesn't exist any longer. Uh, they, they sell the same product, but one was able to adapt to the customer needs, providing a, the right product at the right time, the right customer. The other one was not able to deliver uh, their product. So, and they were not favored by the, by the customers. Um, also, I don't know if you uh, remember uh, this library, the Borders Library. So they, they were also very popular, 2000s, 2005, around that time. Um, you will go, you'll buy books, you'll get some coffee this in there. Uh, but there, when Amazon began to, to gain uh, more, most of the uh, market, they were slowly disappearing because they were selling books. Uh, but again, we're not able to adapt to, to that uh, trend. Uh, customers being able to order the books online and getting them at home. So as I mentioned already, you have these flows going on. You have the material or the product, the information, making sure that you have the right information about the demand, the supply. You have a good visibility about your supply uh, chain and also the funds that are needed to, in terms of money. Uh, supply chain management in a supply network. So again, here we are, we are showing another picture, uh, trying to define the, the flow of cash, product services, information, demand and supply. Uh, so again, supply chain management is concerned with the management and control of the flows of material information and finances in supply chain. So in here we have um, illustration that we uh, basically showing up different companies that are involved within the same supply chain. Uh, so we have the supply side in which we have Thailand suppliers and India suppliers. 
uh, you have the logistic aspect, getting the, the products or the raw materials into Mexico. And then you have the distribution uh, for the, in terms of product development, you have manufacturers in, in Mexico, getting the distribution into Texas and then being sold here in the United States. So multi-country process, uh, obviously, when you make these decisions about who's going to be your supplier, who's going to be your uh, manufacturer and distribution, you're looking at the less expensive option, but at the same time, good quality in terms of the materials that you're going to receive and the products that you're going to you're going to develop. So, uh, a multi-country effort in order to get these products to the to the uh, market. Uh, the task of the supply chain manager is to design, plan, and execute the activities at the different stages so as to provide the desired levels of service to supply chain customers' profitability. Uh, what is the importance of supply chain management? In 2000, the US company spent $1 trillion, which is 10% of the gross domestic product on supply-related activities meaning movement, storage, and control of products across supply chains. Um, so it's a lot of money, right? We, we, and this is 20 years ago. Uh, I, I think that right now we are at the same level, 10, 10 11%. So it's a lot of money. Um, we don't have to go far to observe this behavior. If you just go to I-35 and you drive through I-35, you will see a lot of trucks from different companies moving uh, products uh, south and north. So a lot of activity and that's part of the supply chain. Um, so we want as managers and also as, as facilities planners, we want to eliminate the inefficiencies in the supply chain because we know that will have an impact in terms of cost reduction. So again, we, we observe some of these things now with COVID uh, some of the uh, limitations, let's say that way, of the current supply chain, not only in the United States, but everywhere. Um, so we want to, for example, eliminate those frequent supply chain uh, or supply shortage. We want to make sure that if we are suppliers, we, we have backup plans. If those suppliers are not available, um, High inventory is through the change. So if you are not aware of what's the current demand of the product, we, we might end up with very high inventories, which are, are basically higher cost for the company, keeping those warehouses full, maybe asking for extra space to store those, those products. Uh, so more money that goes into warehousing. And we can go all the way down to the customer. So um, maybe ineffective promotions, Customers are not reacting to, to the product the way you anticipated. Um, high landed cost to the shelf. It's too expensive to get it into the stores um, and so on. So we want to make sure that we eliminate these inefficiencies in the supply chain. Um, so I don't know if, if you know the story about the Febreze uh, product. I know a lot of people use Febreze now, but at the beginning, it was not intended to be a everyday product. So people use it every day now. Um, and you can search for it, but the, the idea is they, they have this very nice product. It, it's a, a chemical, well, it's not chemical, but it's, it's a product that is able to eliminate odors. And they were targeting to the, to the wrong people okay, at the beginning. And that's why the product was not able to, to sell. So they spent a lot of money trying to figure out why, how can they uh, make this product more popular? And at the end, they were able to get to, to the right customer, which was uh, uh, stay at home um, moms that were using the product just to uh, get that smell of cleaning at the house. And they were targeting the product just for people that were trying to eliminate orders but at, at the end, they found out that it was more if you were trying to get that sense of cleaning, getting the customers in that way. And that happens with a lot of products. So I'm trying to attach that to the ineffective promotions, 
not only having a good product, you can have a great product on your hands, but how do you make sure that that product is sold and, and people will get interest in buying that product? So if you wanna search for it, look at the story of, of Pibris and there are other products that started the same way. They're not, they were not successful at the beginning, not until they were able to, to target it to the right customer. Um, so eliminating inefficiencies in supply chains can save billions of dollars. Uh, a generic supply chain, here's the illustration. So you have the sources, plants, vendors, ports that start the supply. And then you have the regional warehouses, stocking points. Warehouses are becoming very popular now in these regional areas. Uh, for Amazon, Walmart, all these suppliers, uh, fill warehouses, stocking uh, points. So you can have also this type of, of suppliers that are in between and then getting into the customers and the demand centers. So the cycle view of supply chains is again, a cyclical process in which you involve the customer, the retailer, the distributor, the manufacturer, the supplier, you take into account the different uh, seasons of the year. So, you know, you have to revisit this for the summer. You have to revisit this for the winter, uh, spring and so on. So it's not, it's not constant, okay? Um, so the supply chain is a group of set cycles, which is cycle at the interface of two successes, successes uh, stages in the supply chain. Each cycle involves the customer stage placing an order and receiving it after it has been supplied by the supplier. Um, one difference in, in size of order, second difference is in predictability of orders. Orders in the procurement cycle are predictable once the manufacturing planning has been done. And this is the predominant view of these uh, enterprise resource planning, ERP, if you have heard about those. It, it is a transaction level view and clearly defines each process as its own order. So again, cyclical, you involve the customer, customer order cycle. So you expect this customer to, over the winter, maybe purchase some new jackets or maybe some winter clothes. And, and then when it comes to the spring, they will be buying some other type of clothes when you get to the summer, maybe some swimsuits. So a cycle uh, is not always constant. Um, replenishment, manufacturing cycle, and procurement cycles are also affected by that cycle at the customer level. So you have a customer arrival, customer triggers an order, supply fulfill the order, and customer receive the order. That's the ideal. Um, so we talk a little bit about the difference between push and pull systems already in the manufacturing lecture. Um, so the idea is it, it, when you're managing your warehouse or when you're managing your supply chain, there's two major point of view or theories in terms of how to handle that. So we have push versus pull. Um, so what is what instigates the movement of the work in the system? So in the push system, work release is based on downstream demand forecast. So you keep inventory to meet actual demand and you act proactively. So in a push system, you're basically looking at your historical data. You say, I have five years of historical data here. I know how much I sold last year, the year before, and three years ago. And then I take that information, I create this time series, which shows the trends for each one of my uh, products. And then I use that information to create a forecast. So a time series, basically you have a Y axis that shows the amount of, that was sold, the X axis as the timeline, and you have this curve that is showing up the, the different trends for the different products. So let me see if I can draw something like that here. We have this and this. And then you have quantity and you have time. And then you know you have these curves that are showing the demand for your product. Then you use those time series to develop a forecast. 
So if you're familiar with forecasts, there's there are different models that you can implement to try to say, okay, this was my behavior. So if I'm trying to forecast the demand a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, you can run that model that is based on this curve and you will have an estimate or a forecast about how much you should uh, sell. So that is the type of information that we use in push systems. We use the forecast, the next month, you're gonna need this many units of this product. So we're gonna manufacture those and we're gonna keep those in inventory. So when the customer comes, we have the product already available and we just ship it and sell it to the customer. So that's why this is act proactively because you are planning before the, the element or the demand happens. The pool system is different. The work release is based on actual demand and the actual status of downstream customers. So now you're no longer, if you think about cars now, you used to see there's um, dealers being full of cars, right? That's no longer the case. Now you have to wait for the car to arrive. So this is the difference. Now you have to put an order, like if you order a Tesla, for example, and you have to wait until the product gets to the gets to you. Um, so you're basically creating a trigger for the system. Yeah, I wanna buy this. Now the system is gonna pull all the resources to make that car and deliver the car for you. Um, so in pool systems, work release is based on actual demand and the actual status of the downstream customers. May cause long delivery lead times. And in a system, you're gonna act reactively. So making specific risk estimate for a company after talking to the recruiter. That's another uh, example. Um, and this um, type of theory, full system was developed by Toyota. Going back to history, I know most of you were not born um, by that time. This is how Toyota became competitive in the auto industry. Uh, they, they were, they developed this theory that instead of, of manufacturing cars, a lot, a lot of cars to sell it to the public, they will create a very um, efficient system in which they all only produce when needed. And that's how they were able to uh, create these uh, first Toyota cars in the 80s that were very inexpensive. They started to sell those in different markets and that's how they started growing. Uh, so when you were comparing car prices, uh, let's say with General Motors, Ford, and you're comparing against Toyota and Volkswagen, that was the other company that did it very efficiently. The price difference was big and customers were that were moving into less expensive and gas, less consumption of gas, they were going into the Toyota uh, product uh, instead of the uh, General Motors and Ford. Um, so they used, they were the ones that created this uh, theory of pool systems. So pool versus push fuel supply chains, you have the, the timing boundary here. Um, so you have the procurement, manufacturing and replenishment cycles. It's a big arrow there showing you all the time it takes for the customer order. Uh, cycle in the pool process. You see, this is a, a time mark. So for push systems, everything will happen before the customer order arrive. For the pool system, everything is gonna start happening after the customer order arrives. So that's the main, main difference between them. Um, so in this view, processes are divided based on their timing relative to the timing of a customer order. Uh, so push before their customer arrives, pull after the customer order arrives. Uh, the key difference is the uncertainty during the two phases, right? So for a push process, let's say something like the pandemic happened, you have all these inventory already in place, so you will be able to supply as needed, which is an advantage for pull system, now you're getting all these orders, you know, might, might not be able to get to the raw materials. So that will create a disadvantage and you might not be able to fulfill these uh, products in time. So again, 
importance of planning, importance of taking care of your supply chain, planning based on uh, the possibility of unexpected events. Yes, sir. It, it seems like Yeah, that's a that's a very good point. And uh, I think from my perspective, what really happens is not that the pool system failed, is that the supplier planning was not done properly. Like if you have a pool system and you were depending on only one supplier and that supplier was already packed with another customer, like happened with Miles, for example, most of the P uh, the equipment that was used for protection was developed in other countries. Then when you, you are trying to reach out to these suppliers, they were not responding to your to your needs. And, and I think that's what the, the, re, the real problem was, at least in, in this uh, COVID situation, is that not, it was not that we didn't have the cap capability as a country to react. It was more that we didn't have access to, to the uh, raw materials to get the, the products done. And, um, and I think there's a mindset now in terms of planning for those type of events in which we are not necessarily relying on suppliers uh, from other countries, but we also develop our own capabilities here in the States that when something like that happens, we also have access to good suppliers that can help us uh, ramp up production, yeah. But if it's complicated, right? But, but they're gonna survive. Yes, exactly, exactly. And, and that's the thing. How do you make sure that it's not like you create this supplier and then there's no pandemic. So they're gonna just wait for something like that to happen. Uh, so can we uh, build a market for those suppliers that are not just depending on, on that specific product, but they can also develop all the products that are commonly used in the States so they can continue uh, being available. And again, it's, it's complicated because we we're typically, so engineers, planners, always look at the dollars and cents, uh, but planning uh, for a robust system has to also to consider maybe it's a little bit more expensive, but in the long run, it will save you money, you know? And, and you plan not only for what's less expensive route, but you also plan for what can happen. And then when, if something like that happens, you know that you still have a, a customer that you need to serve and you're uh, available for doing, for doing those, those, uh, those products. Um, so a lot of things, I mean, right now uh, we are getting through that, uh, maybe um, going out the pandemic cycle, hopefully. Uh, and there's a lot of conversations in, in that particular area. So how can we make sure that this doesn't happen? Uh, how do we plan our supply chain? How do we make sure that if, if we get faced with a similar situation, we don't go through the same issues that we faced uh, at the beginning? at least of the pandemic. Uh, so yes, I would not say this is already a solved problem, but I know there's a lot of conversation in, in terms of uh, making sure that we have enough, um, at least have access when need to uh, for, for the basic products that are needed to uh, support a, a, a pandemic. Any other questions? Yeah, and there's, these are, yeah, if, if you guys, I don't know, I mean, are interested in research, there's like a, an open, I mean, there's a lot of questions about supply chain management, especially with disruption of, of supply chain based on, and that, not only pandemics, but hurricanes, earthquakes. Uh, yeah, so a lot of things that can happen that can uh, put a, a stop on, on the, delivery of products 
Um, yeah, and companies are looking for new ideas, new algorithms, new models uh, that will help make them the best decisions in, in those areas. So if you think about Amazon, I have some, a lot of friends already working for Amazon. Um, after they finished grad school, they weren't working for them and they assigned product, projects in this same topic. So uh, we have all, they have a lot of data and is they need people to help them make sense of that data and use that data uh, to make better decisions. Uh, and that's not, not only for Amazon, a lot of companies are, are trying to improve their efficiency and they're hiring people that are uh, interested in that area or have some expertise in that area, forecasting, uh, decision-making on their uncertainty, uh, supply chain, logistics, and so on. So open field, and especially now that we are, we're getting through this uh, event. Any, any other questions? Good, so a supply chain strategy framework, um, so we have a mission strategy, tactics, and decisions. Uh, mission, the reason for the existence of an organization, the strategy, a plan for achieving organization goals. Tactics, the action taken to accomplish the strategies and the operational decisions. These are the ones that we are mostly uh, involved with, the day-to-day -day decisions to support these tactics. So when you think about looking for a job or um, interviewing for a company, you always need to go, I mean, my advice is that you go all the way to read their mission statement, what this company stands for. And you understand that clearly because every decision that is made, as you can see here, is based on that mission statement. So if you're familiar with that, you're familiar with the business strategy, uh, then you'll be more, you'll be more uh, aligned when you're answering their questions with the type of, of goals that the company is trying to, to achieve. Um, so mission statement, strategy, tactics, and operational decisions. Um, live strategy for TED is uh, an example. So TED is an undergrad. He would like to have a career in business, to have a good job and earn enough income to live comfortable. If you think about that, I don't know if this sounds familiar, but as me as an undergrad, I will, I will think about this way too. So if you try to split this into goal strategy, tactics and operation, a goal, successful career with a good income strategy, maybe obtain a bachelor's degree, maybe a master's degree, tactics, select college and concentration, operations, register, buy books, take courses, study, graduate and get a job. Um, so again, not only at the supply chain level, but also at the personal level, you can have the same type of planning uh, mindset. Uh, linking supply chain and business strategy. So here's some um, areas that we can think about uh, for competitive business strategy. We have three areas product development strategy, or the portfolio of products and the timing of product introductions, marketing strategy, and supply chain strategy. Product development takes, I mean, takes time. I know people that work with uh, Apple and they take about a year to complete the, the planning, the introduction, let's say of a new ship, uh, the testing of the new ship, and then finally, delivery of that chip so they can develop the new product. Uh, so a year, uh, and we are talking about a very efficient company. A marketing strategy, so that goes, goes together, right? Uh, you're bringing this new product, you wanna make sure people understand the new product features and so on, and then the supply chain. When are you gonna deliver the product? When is it gonna be available and so on? So. We have this new product development, the engineering, we have the marketing and sales, uh, finance, and then we have the operations, distributions and service. So this is where the supply chain strategy or the supply chain management uh, is important. Uh, here's another example, uh, strategies and product development, 
It relates to technologies for future operations via patents and set of product services. So for example, be the technology leader as IBM was at some point, offer many products that was Dell computers. Their main goal was to, you were able to um, design your own computer, basically. You were able to decide what type of screen, what type of processor, what type of RAM. Uh, so that was how they became different from other companies. Um, so another example here, this is called a Tata's Nano, a car that was sell at $2,500. It was the uh, world's cheapest car uh, at some point. So just $2,500. Um, and this was a, in India. The top speed for this car was 105 kilometers an hour. The engine volume 60, uh, 623 cc's. And it gets you, uh, used to get you 50 miles a gallon. And the annual sales target was about 200,000. Um, problem with the car was uh, at least the introduction. They were trying to introduce that product to the United States, but the product was not uh, meeting the, the standards for safety. Uh, but it was at some point called the cheapest car in the world. Um, I don't know if you're still selling this or not, but the, the, it was a, a product that was targeting a specific market and, um, and so on. Strategies for marketing and sales strategies uh, relates to positioning, pricing, and promotion of products. Uh, for example, never offer more than 40% discount. Those are sales strategies. Um, Specifically that number, I don't know why that 40% specifically, but I guess it will put into um, discussion or maybe the quality of the product. At the air, everyday low price at Walmart and this man, demands putting via coupons uh, for Best Buy. Supply chain management strategy relates to the performance, transportation, storage and delivery. Uh, so for example, never use more than one supplier for every input. Uh, never expedite orders just because they are late and always use domestic suppliers within the sales season, not in advance. Uh, fitting the supply chain to the customer and vice versa. We need to understand the customer wishes or what they want, or at least make them aware that they want your product. Um, understand the capabilities of the supply chain and match these goals or the uh, demand with the capabilities. Uh, the challenge is how to meet these extensive wishes with limited uh, capabilities. So let's say you have only the capability of, of manufacturing uh, standard cars, and then you have customers that want X, Y, Z uh, adaptation. So can you rely on your manufacturing capabilities to do that? Uh, achieving strategic fit, consistent supply chain management and competitive strategies, uh, understanding the customer, uh, for example, the range of demand, production lot size, connected with the seasonality of the product, response time. So if you, uh, here's the organ transportation example which you know that this cannot wait, right? So you need to be, uh, you need to have a list of people that are available. So when the, this becomes available, you can adapt and react quickly. Uh, service level, product availability, uh, product variety, innovation, and accommodating for poor quality. So, um, so if you, you get the, um, let's say some, some materials that are not uh, at the standard. So how are you gonna to react to those? Implied demand, uncertainty for supply chains, uh, implied trouble for supply chain. So the uncertainty again, is not only important for supply chain management, but for every uh, major decision that you're gonna make uh, as a professional or as, a, as an individual. So how do you manage the uncertainty? How do you minimize Certainty, so you can make uh, the best decisions. But the uncertainty is going to be there for sure. 
contributors to implied demand uncertainty, um, for example, commodities, a detergent, you have long list time still, all those things. Uh, customized product, high fashion clothing, emergency steel for maintenance and replacement. So you have the customer need in terms of price and re responsiveness, but also the implied demand uncertainty. So if you need to um, react quickly to some specific product and you need to uh, make sure that those are available to your customers, um, Again, going back into the uncertainty, how do you minimize that and how do you make the best decisions that are available with the information that you have? So some of the things that uh, we can do have short lead times, um, product variety, uh, a distribution channel variety, so you are not just relying on one of them, high rate of innovation and high customer service level, all increase the implied demand uncertainty. So this is the cost responsiveness trade-off for supply chain. So at the, at the left, we have the responsiveness for the Y axis, we have the responsiveness in time, high service level and product variety. And then at the bottom, we have the cost in dollars. So you can see that, um, the cost is very high if your responsiveness is very high, right? So high, high. Uh, so if you if you want to be very uh, good in terms of responding, uh, responding to your customers, uh, that has a very good cost, a very high cost. And as you move down, you can see the efficient uh, frontier. You try to compromise on, on that uh, responsiveness then the cost starts to slow down or go down uh, as part of the process. Um, so we have a, an efficient region also uh, marked in this area. You want to get, you don't want to get to to that uh, area because then um, your product or your customer is not going to be happy. So you want to stay within this efficient frontier and about this inefficient uh, region. Um, Now, in terms of wishes versus capabilities, we have here the responsiveness spectrum uh, for responsiveness, high cost supply chains at the top in the Y axis and the low cost here. Oops. High cost, low cost, and the imply uncertainty. So you have an uncertain demand and certain demand here to the to the left. Um, so you can see here the example, but actually what this is the limiting here is the zone of strategic peak. So you wanna stay within those margins. Uh, so for certain demand, like if you're talking about food, um, you have a certain demand, you know, you're gonna get these many people on average every day. Um, and then a, a, it will be low, well, certain demand and low cost is it remains efficient at that bottom part of the, of the, of the graph. But as you get uh, more uncertain in terms of your demand, then you know that your responsiveness has to be higher. Uh, you have to be quick to respond to, to that demand with high uncertainty. So your cost obviously is going to increase. So for example, if you are, are a, an owner of a gourmet dinner restaurant, you know that you have to be able to accommodate the, uh, the request from the customers, which are gonna be uncertain, right? Because you don't know what the customer is gonna order. So that will imply that you have to be very high in terms of response but also that will cost you. So that's why that those um, restaurants are more expensive. Um, so that's the zone of strategic fee. If you have very high uncertainty, then you need to make sure that you have all the materials that you will need 
to respond to every possible situation, that will increase your cost because you have to be very responsive to all the decisions that might happen that will affect your, your product. But if you have a certain demand, you know, people are gonna come and buy bottles of water and you will get an order every week of a hundred boxes of water. Then you know that you can run a very efficient process. You need to have your bottles. You need to have a way to filter water and, and it's nothing out of the uh, typical demand. Um, so that's the uh, wishes versus capability and the zone of strategic fit. Um, so I have this table, I think we can skip it for now. Here's showing the top uh, uh, 10 retailers reported in 2008, the first four. Um, uh, some additional strategies for big retailers, uh, Walmart efficiency, um, basically making sure that they buy all these big lots and they have, uh, they can sell uh, the product very inexpensive because they buy a lot of them uh, at the same time. So typically when you buy big lots of products, your cost is very small, so you can sell it at a lower price. Target, uh, they target more quality and service. Uh, care for um, is international ambience. Um, this is another example. Uh, Kmart, which no longer exists, uh, didn't have a specific strategy. They were confusing to, to people. They were squeezed between Target and Walmart. Uh, they rely a lot on coupons and they were unsuccessful. So they merged with Sears in 2004 um, and they're called Sears Holdings. So they disappear basically. Uh, other factors, uh, multiple products in the supply chain, multiple customers for a given product. So how to separate supply chains and tailor supply chains, for example, Barnes and Nobles, retailer, all and or e-tailing. So they were trying to address both type of customers. Uh, whereas Amazon was focusing on the e-market, they were trying to accommodate both at the same time. Um, and that created some trouble with their supply chain. Uh, competitors, four factor and global, online programs compete globally. That's the other thing. So when you are online, you can sell, you have more access to your customer pool. So if you're just basing your, your strategy on retailing, you know, you're going to have a limited uh, area to, to sell. Other factors, product life cycle, uh, shortening in the sense of when you shorter the life cycle, um, you, you get less time to, to sell the product, basically. In, for example, the life cycle of DVDs. It started, they were popular. Now they are no longer, well, few people do buy them, but they're not capturing a, a good market of the, of the sales any longer. So now people are buying uh, e-copies or downloading their, their movies into the computer and so on. So supply chain management strategy moves toward efficiency and low implied uncertainty as product age. For example, air travel is becoming more efficient. Software and I lead the drive for efficiency uh, flat screen TV producers uh, in Taiwan was looking for ways to make its supply chains more efficient. Replacement cells selling to replace broken units. Uh, for example, AC replacement is about 50% of the market uh, for air conditioners. Um, achieving a strategic fit over the life cycle, and going back to the zone of strategic fit here, um, it depends on where you want to be, right? So you understand the difference now? So if you have very high uncertain demand, you know that you have to plan for being uh, more flexible and have more availability of your product and that will incur in a higher cost. So you'll be in these areas. If you have very certain demand, uh, like uh, books for college students, you know, how many students you will get every year, you know how many books you're gonna be selling for chemistry, 
So you have a low cost supply change. Uh, absolutely, you know, those are gonna happen at the beginning of this semester and so on. Integration is a central theme in supply chain management. So as I mentioned at the beginning, you don't want to be separated inventory and logistics. We want to integrate. We want to understand what's happening in the entire chain so we can make better decisions. So building synergies by integrating business functions, department and company is important. Um, so here we have the strategic uh, scope. Uh, the strategic scope must cover all boxes, at least at the supply chain end. So we are talking here, we have competitive strategy, product development strategy, supply chain strategy, and marketing strategy. So we need to be, I mean, if you're in charge of the supply chain uh, strategy, we have to be able to communicate or at least get information about suppliers, manufacturers, distributors, retailers, and customers. Uh, that's what's going to make us more um, efficient if we can integrate that information into our decision making. Each stage must have fit across its vertical boxes and supply chain strategy, uh, supplying all players. This fit allows the countering of multiple orders and help avoid for local optimization, meaning that. You don't want to make decisions only to benefit the distributor. You don't want to make decisions only to benefit the customer. Your decisions have to cover all these areas. Efficiency in terms of balancing all these areas. Supply chain drivers and obstacles. Drivers of supply chain performance. How to achieve efficiency and responsiveness. Uh, we have the inventory transportation and facilities. Those are the logistical drivers. And the cross-functional drivers are the information sourcing and pricing. So again, logistics and inventory, they have to be connected. We need to be aware of what's, what's happening and we need to make sure that we balance the effort and we are efficient. And here's our part as facilitators, uh, layout designers, we also have to be uh, responsive and efficient to uh, what's needed or from our supply chain. The inventory uh, convenience in terms of uh, cycle inventory, no customer buy X one by one, right? So we, we, we sell them in packages with 12 at least. Unstable demand, we have seasonal inventory, for bathing suits, Christmas toys, and computer sales, uh, randomness, safety inventory. Like for example, we have a sudden increase in the demand, so we have this safety inventory to supply that. And pipeline, making sure that we understand the working process, what's on hold, what's waiting for to be delivered, what's waiting to be completed. So all these things are connected to our inventory. Uh, so as Facilities planner, you might be in charge of planning for these decisions um, or and also designing for the flow of these uh, products within the inventory and the delivery of these products. Uh, if we think about the latest law, the long run averages are equal to the expected values. Um, so the inventory is equal to the output per time or the throughput times the delay time or flow time. So R times T is the pipeline inventory. That should be our pipeline inventory. But again, uncertainty is not only related to the customer, but also related to your manufacturing process. Um, we saw that with the planning for uh, the defectives, right? At some point at the, of the first part of the semester. So how do you make sure that you manufacture enough units. Uh, so taking into account the uncertainty in terms of the defects. Uh, so all that connected to the uncertainty that is faced by not only the supply chain, but in the manufacturing process. Transportation, different ways of the uh, distribution, air truck, rail, ship, pipeline, electronic. So we have to be aware of what will be the best way to, to distribute our, our product. And then facilities, which is what we, we are concerned. 
uh, production. So we're going to be flexible or dedicated. We saw the advantages or we discussed the advantages of having a flexible human resource or staff, right? So if you have the need, you can move those around. Uh, flexibility cost service, can you, your instructor teach music as well as supply chain management, right? So if you, can your operator manage uh, X machine versus Y machine? Um, so those are the type of things that we, we want to uh, plan for. So when we hire people, when we hire staff, can we cross train them so we can have them take care of different areas of the company when, so when situations arise, we can be more flexible. Inventory like operations, receiving, prepackaging, storing, picking, packaging, sorting, accumulating, shipping. Uh, so all those things connected with the facility, job loss storage, need more space. Those are the decisions. Do you have the orders ready? Uh, you're gonna need more, more time. You're gonna have run over time and so on. Cross docking. If you're not aware of what cross docking is, typically you will have some warehouses located in different areas. So let's say you have El Paso, San Antonio, and Amarillo. You have these warehouses or manufacturing facilities. And in here you are, you have apples, here you have clothes, and here you have tires. Right, so if you are delivering to your stores, let's say you have others, you have several stores that require these products, instead of having a truck going to deliver the apples, the clothes here, and the tires directly, you have a cross dock that is going to know how many apples, uh, clothes, and tires are needed in this store. And then you can, instead of going directly to directly to the stores, you will send the trucks to the cross dock and they will deliver to the stores. Instead of having three trucks going into the store, you will have one truck with all the products that you need. And that is the cross docking. And Walmart makes good, good use of that strategy. It's very efficient. Uh, you're saving trucks, you're saving gas, you, and, and you are able to accommodate the needs of the stores. Um, so those are the type of things that are important. And if you're a facility, basically what you have here is an operation of getting product, rearranging, and send it to the stores. It's not, nothing else. Um, no manufacturing, no nothing uh, along those lines. Information, very important. We are in the information era. How do we use all this data to make decisions? Uh, how do you make this, uh, use this data to make assessment of the quality of the products that we are getting, the feedback of the customers, complaints, all that information is available. So the question is, how do you use this information for benefit? So there's a lot of companies now that have these big libraries of data and they're wanting to know how they can use that information that they're being collecting to make better decisions especially in, in terms of supply chain, understanding better the customer so we can plan better for our, our product demand and also for our supply chain. Um, uh, I, it's a lot of information there. Uh, I, I can tell you about, for example, Target. They, they, they have the strategy. So if you have visited Target, they always ask you to scan your, your app or to enter your phone number when you pay. Um, they use that information to learn about your, your uh, purchasing history, what type of products you, you buy. And then they can use that information also to, um, and this is not, I'm not making this up. I'm, I'm, I have read about this and this is a strategy. They can um, target a market campaign 
to your needs. Like you can receive a, a let's say one of those pamphlets that they sell with uh, Christmas time and your pamphlet is gonna be different from a neighbor in the same area that you live. And that they do that based on your customers, um, the, the way you purchase things, it, all that information they're collecting, they use it to their advantage. So they know what, what to sell you and what you can purchase in the future and so on. And that uses information to make your, your company more uh, successful in terms of delivering products and selling products. Uh, characteristics of the good information, information, global scope, strategy, coordinated decisions, analytical models, and supply chain success. Um, in terms of information, is it accurate? Is it accessible? Is it update? Is it in the current form? Those are challenges. So if you're gonna be working in this type of area of analyzing data, I can tell you um, the last one, in the correct format form, that's the, the one that you're gonna be facing more issues, more problems, because um, you'll be accessing different databases and not all of them are in the same format. So how do you put them in the same format so you, it can be useful for you to, to make an analysis? Um, quality of information, information drives decisions. So good information makes good decisions, helps, in materials requirement planning, enterprise resource planning, SAP, electronic data interchange, and so on. SAP is a software that is also used for uh, the planning of a um, production and supply chain and logistics. So it's used by a lot by a lot of companies, and I think they're there in based in Germany. Uh, relevant information and how to use information. So ERP systems. Enterprise resource planning is a business management software, uses push strategy instead of pull. Uh, it provides real-time information, coordination, information sharing. Um, is expensive and difficult to implement. About 25% of ERP installations are canceled within a year. And about 70% of ERP installations go over budget. So again, these are um, software-based uh, tools that are being implemented in major companies to help them be more efficient in their supply chain management. So ERP is one, um, as I mentioned already, SAP is another one, and there are other uh, that you will, you will see in the future. Um, IT push, you see this has been growing and now is, twice, three times what it used to be. Um, so IT is here to stay. We need to learn how to use information make, to make better decisions. Um, sourcing role in the supply chain, set of processes required to purchase goods and services in a supply chain, supplier selection, single versus multiple suppliers and contract negotiation, uh, very important. And role in the competitive strategy, sourcing is crucial. It affects efficiency and responsiveness in a supply chain. Uh, here, marking this in red, because as I've been mentioning this a lot, in-house versus outsourced decisions. Are we gonna manufacture our supply, um, our raw materials in-house, or are we gonna rely on other people? Uh, this is in terms of improving efficiency and responsiveness. Um, more than half of the revenue spends for sourcing. Uh, Cisco sources low-end products, for example, home routers uh, from China. So what are the decisions that we're gonna make? Are we gonna be uh, maybe a little bit more expensive or more efficient in terms of making sure that we respond to demands or we're gonna save money and then be more certain in terms of delivering the product? Pricing, the role in supply chain. Pricing determines the amount of to charge to customers in the supply chain. So pricing strategies can be used to match demand and supply. Uh, so you know, you should know the price elasticity for the products that you sell. Role in the competitive strategy, use pricing strategies to improve efficiency and responsiveness, low price and low product availability. 
very priced by response times. Uh, for example, Amazon users, if you want to get a product delivered in 24 hours, they will charge for that. Um, components of pricing decisions, pricing and economies of scale. So this means that you buy more, it's less expensive. You buy one or two units, it's more expensive. You buy 1 million, it should uh, cost you less. So that's economies of scale. Everyday low pricing versus high low pricing. So Walmart pays this low pricing, uh, advertising, they sell low prices. Uh, we have companies or, or um, stores like, uh, what's the name, Kohl's. They have these electronic uh, digital uh, prices uh, screens that they can change the price uh, quickly. So you don't, don't have, I mean, they can adapt quickly to changes in prices. Uh, fixed price versus menu, menu pricing, uh, packing and delivery location, time customer pickup, bundling products, products and services, and so on. Uh, so consideration for supply chain drivers, you can read through this on your own, but we have the drivers here, inventory, transportation, facilities, information, sourcing, and pricing. In terms of facility, which is our area, consolidation and dedicated proximity versus flexibility and so on. Um, major obstacles to achieving fit. Supply chains is big, variety of product services, spoiled customers, multiple owners, uh, multiple objectives, globalization. So this will have a local optimization, forcing the decisions to be made only focusing on one area of the supply chain in a lack of global fit. Uh, dealing with multiple owners and local optimization. Um, so we have information, lack of information coordination, contractual coordination, coordination with real options, and without coordination, misleading reliance on metrics. So all these things will affect uh, your efficiency in terms of having a, a, a good uh, or an efficient supply chain. Instability and randomness. So we talk about that again, uncertainty, planning for uncertainty. How do you plan for that? How do you make sure that you are able to get the uh, raw materials in time so you can supply your, your products? Um, so increasing product variety, shrinking product life cycle. So you retire products uh, sooner, customer fragmentation, push for customization, segmentation. So customers asking for more for the products, uh, fragmentation of supply chain shortness ownership. So with globalization, we have multiple orders. So how do we manage that? Um, and then some common problems here, lack of relevant supply chain metrics, how to measure responsiveness, how to measure efficiency, cost, worker performance, et, et cetera. Uh, poor inventory status information, all these things can happen, theft, transaction errors, information delays, misplaced inventory, spoilers, product quality and yield, lack of visibility in the supply chain. So the problems that you will face as, as an engineer. So how do you manage that uh, to make sure that you get an efficient system? More information about uh, common problems, poor IT design, ignoring uncertainties. You just say, okay, this is what we're gonna do. It doesn't matter what. Internal customer mission, poor integration, elusive inventory costs, and supply chain being insensitive to product design. Okay, so uh, we made it to, to the end. Any, any questions? Okay, so again, I hope this gives you an understanding of what supply chain management is and also how it connects to the facilities planning design. On Wednesday, we're gonna continue our discussion uh, of designing facilities. And we will talk also about the, the exam if, we, if I get the all papers rated by, by Wednesday. Any questions? Good, so we'll talk more on Wednesday.